Hello, my name is Judith Klein and I'm from Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand. I have recently finished a master's degree, making me an officially qualified creative technologist, which is pretty much kind of like being a wizard. This talk is about prototyping apps, and that means how to make something that looks and behaves like an app without touching a line of code. And yes, I'm aware that we are at a developers conference, and I'll talk about why this can actually be an important part of the development process. I love coding, and I love designing things, and I feel quite fortunate that I get to wear both of these hats in the work that I do. So I get to create things, and I get to code it and design it. Part of my master's degree involved creating an app, and the various prototypes I made along the way were very useful in terms of documentation and explaining my thought processes and rationale. So that's my interest and experience in, the area, in this area and why I'm standing here giving this talk today. In the interest of full disclosure, those are the only companies I am affiliated, officially affiliated with in some way. I mentioned a few different tools and products in this talk, and it's mostly solely on the basis that I've been using them and I've found them very useful. So let's get on to it. So I've got an idea for an app. It's a million dollar idea, maybe even a billion dollar idea, but we're all friends here, right? So I can tell you. Nowadays, people are taking pictures, right? They, they're their phones now, they're out, something catches their eye, they want to take it, but then the photo's just sitting there. What if they take that photo and they can instantaneously put it out there on the line and share it with their friends? Oh. I'm going to call it Exchangeogram. <laughs> if you didn't get it, watch the internship. It's a funny movie. So what's the first thing you do? Tweet about it? Go talk to a VC? Open Xcode? No. Close Xcode? Close your laptop? I know there's probably that really cool new back-end feature you've been dying to try out, and, but often a lot of the best ideas in the world begin with just pen and paper. But first, let's take a minute to talk about you. Let's have a quick poll. Let's see all the developers in the room. Hands up, like you're proud. Yes, excellent. That's if you sit and you write code either at uh, the instruction of someone else or of your own free will, or some combination of the two. Let's see the designers. Yay. Who fits into both those categories? Maybe anything else? Any other categories? Have you wandered in here by mistake and have no <laughs> idea who all these crazy people are? Yes. Welcome. Who has already had a go at creating prototypes in some way, shape, or form? Oh, excellent. Um, cool. Well, I hope I can impart some new wisdom on, to you today. I'm going to be giving a few examples. I've given a few examples already of how prototyping could apply based on what role you might be in. And keep in mind, you shouldn't be prototyping for the sake of prototyping, if it doesn't contribute to what you're trying to achieve. And I'll talk more on this later. So why should you actually prototype? You probably don't need too much convincing, seeing as you're already in this talk. But let's go through a few of the main points. Prototyping is great for communicating ideas to others in your team. What, it, it communicates what your app is supposed to do. If you, were, if you are working in a team, it's likely that people who aren't you will need to understand what your ideas are and what it's supposed to do, especially if you're not the developer who's actually going to code it. If you're working with a client, it saves lots of pain and heartache later. If what they had in mind was something completely different, which we know clients like to do, or just change their minds, or Maybe even if you're on your own one man or woman team, it can be really useful to have that frame of reference if it's 2 a.m. and you're looking at your code and you can't remember what it's doing or what it was supposed to do or how it ever worked in the first place. Essentially, it lets you be on the same page as any stakeholders and that includes yourself as well. Prototyping can help generate new ideas. As a quick activity, turn to the person next to you. And I want you to say to the person next to you, the first thing that comes into your head when I ask you to think of something red. <laughs> Who thought of an apple? 
Uh, maybe we're a bit biased. Who, did anyone think of a fire truck? Oh, we've got another fire truck. Yeah. Anything else? Oh. Yeah. Well, the point is here that something that could be the first thing that jumps to your mind is quite possibly the same thing that could jump into someone else's mind. So that's why it's really important to don't stop at your first idea. And once you actually start the process of prototyping, you find that you can you often find that you come up with lots of new ideas and you look back on your first ones, have no idea what you were thinking. Once you have your idea you like, it can be a way to iterate and refine that idea. And there's some of the different methods I'm going to show you today that let you try out lots of different ideas quickly and easily that may not be as easy to quickly iterate in code. Once you've created your prototype, it's a great way to get it in the hands of your stakeholders or target users to get feedback. Once again, uh, it's something that people who aren't you might think differently about. And it, it can save you time getting that feedback before you invest highly into development time or very shiny graphics uh, if you've hired a designer. As soon as you get people who aren't you using your app, it becomes very easy to spot the flaws in your design and the pitfalls. Something that might seem very logical and straightforward to you might not be as logical and straightforward to anyone else. Just because you've read the human interface guidelines doesn't necessarily know, mean you know how to design good UI. It just means you know how to not get rejected from the app store, which is important. But more than that, it, it's also about figuring out the flow and structure of your app and the logic behind, the logic behind it. It forces you to think through the interaction. How do I get from point A to point B? What's the more, mo lo most logical way to go about this? Imagine the world's most amazing camera app. And it has, you know, with all the new APIs for camera control and the beautiful new iPhone 6 or 6 Plus camera. It's an amazing app. But you can't, for the life of life, of figure out how, where the button is to take a photo. Unfortunately, there you might come across apps before that behave like this. So you, you can't figure out how to do the most basic functions. In this talk, I'm mostly going to talk about these two points, communicating ideas uh, and testing them. If you're interested in those two, there is a session from WWDC this year, prototyping fake it till you make it, which has much more focuses on this idea of using prototyping as a way of generating new ideas and iterating them. So there's a few things I want to cover in the time I have. I'm going to take you through the different stages of prototyping from low fidelity mock-ups you, you can use to start trying out how your app's going to work that don't take very much time to get up and running. And for each day through to high fidelity, the very shiny ones that might be something you give to a client or a venture capitalist who's going to give you lots and lots of money. I'm going to be breaking these down, each of these down into three components. Firstly, what kind of assets you can expect to be using and how to collate, how to collate all these. How to pull all these assets together and add the interactivity using the, the different tools I'm going to show you. And finally, how to actually share and get that prototype into the hands of the people who need to see it. What, and this may be easier for some tools than for others, but what we're aiming to do is create a tappable prototype that you can hand to someone and run on device so you can s simulate the experience as closely as possible. Similarly, if you're not the only person working on the design, many of these tools have collaboration functionality built in, which is especially useful if you're working with people in different cities, different countries, uh, which is very common nowadays. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to be, as I mentioned, looking at creating t inter interactive tappable mockups that can run on a device. And this is slightly different from wireframing, though the two terms are used sometimes interchangeably. Wireframing, a wireframe more focuses on the layout using shapes and lines to say this is where things are going to go. It's more common from a web design perspective. Prototyping tools are increasingly a dime a dozen. I had someone tell me about another one just as I was getting my coffee before this that I hadn't heard of, and lots of them do have very similar functionalities. Uh, these are some that you might have heard of before. And these are, these are just some a few I pulled off the first page of a Google search. And there's lots and lots of more pages of them, but these aren't the ones I'm going to be talking about. The ones I'm going to be looking at are those, and some of them aren't actually dedicated prototyping tools, as you'll see. So generally, what we're interested in is this kind of workflow of what role prototyping plays and how to incorporate into your workflow. 
So let's have a look at low fidelity. For low fidelity prototypes, collating your assets is super easy. You should be able to get your sketch onto a napkin. You should be able to get your sketch, sketch onto a napkin, and sometimes in Silicon Valley, that's all you need, so we're done here. Thank you very much. Um, but we're not in Silicon Valley. I'm not the best artist in the world, and I drew that myself. Um, I honestly am not an artist. If you want to be a bit fancier, you can use an app such as Paper to draw directly onto your iPad and then get those into your prototypes. And I have many, many notes and notebooks and pages scattered, filled with, with these sketches, and often they only make sense to me. So how can I make these more useful? To create these resources together, I'm going to be using an app called Pop or Prototype on Paper. So I'm going to have a look at a demo. So here I have Pop. So one thing I really like about Pop is I can do this very quickly on my phone. I've made prototypes just sitting on the bus on the way home before. So I can create a new project. And I can select what kind of device I want it for. Uh, I can actually run this on iPad as well, and it gives me the option to create an iPad interface. On the iPad, you can create it for iPhone as well, but it's a bit harder to create a mock-up for an iPad on the iPhone. So I'm going to say 5, 5S in portrait, and I can create this. And I have my paper prototype sketches here. And so I can tap on the camera button, and I can take my photos. See what the lighting's like here. You get a nice little grid to line it up. Depending how shaky your hands are. So maybe do this one. And this one, it's a map, by the way. <laughs> and that one there. All right, so I can go next. It now gives me an option to recrop them a bit if my hands were a bit shaky, which they were. And I can say that I'm happy with that. That one is a bit shaky and blurry, but that will do for now. And that one. And excellent. So once I've confirmed all those. Yes. Don't know why it's not letting me tap. There we go. Done. And it's only given me my first one. Okay, so we have that one there, and I can just quickly retake that one. Apologies. Let's go with Oop, that's a bit wrong. All right, next. So let's go with those. Done. All right. So that's my first one there, and I want to add, add all those, all three of those as buttons. So I can add a hotspot here, link to that one, links back to itself, so we don't want that one right now, because that's the page we're on. It's just a simple tab bar app. I can link that one to that view, and I can add another one, link to my map, my beautiful map. And I can already quickly preview that, so I can see. Oh. So of course, I've only added to one of the views. But once you add up all those connections, you can already very quickly see you can have a tappable one. So in the interest of pleasing the demo gods, here's one I prepared earlier. So there's my app. I can tap on this. It shows me where my buttons are if I've done it wrong. So I can take a photo of you all. And I can go back. So you can add some other interactions to swipe that it can detect. And again, it will prompt you through. So I can go to my map. There we go. Some, some beautiful photos other people are sharing. And oh, there's a nice photo. And I can go back. And this is all just from having take, drawn out my sketches and taking photos and linking them up. So that's pretty easy. And it doesn't take very much time at all. So if I disconnect from that now. 
a low fidelity prototype is usually a bit closer to a wireframe, but you can still have that added interactivity. Sharing can be as easy as inviting another pop user, or you can share it with a URL that anyone can see, and they can view that in the web browser, or they've actually got a, a web app as well that you can use for both editing this. So once you've taken your photos on the phone, you can add that interactively later if the phone, if it's a bit, the app is a bit fiddly. The, the one I've just made is actually at that URL there, bit.ly slash popdw14. And already I can share that with anyone here. It works a bit better on iPhone, but it, if, if you're viewing in a web browser, it gives you the skin of the phone around it. So I'm about to get to that. Yes, so some pros and cons. You've got it for, you've got cross-platform. They offer apps for, in the iOS, native apps for iOS, Android, and Windows. Works online. Cons, they say it's beta, and you're limited to five prototypes, and you have to start deleting them. But they won't accept any money from you. Uh, it's free for now. They say they won't charge start, they won't charge until it's good enough. And I've been using this one for about a year, and when I went to write this presentation, I realized they had the website of it, which I was surprised about. So they've been coming along in leaps and bounds. So maybe if you want to try it out, do it before they start asking for money. Uh, but it's a great little app. So before we go any further, you might be saying, hold on, I'm not a designer. I don't know where to. It can be difficult to bridge that gap between paper sketches and something that actually starts to look like an app. So before we move on to medium fidel fidelity, I want to talk a bit about this. So maybe you don't have your designer on board yet. Maybe you need this prototype to be able to secure your funding, to be able to hire a designer. How do you bridge that gap to go from sketches to something that looks like an app? There's nothing wrong with starting with boilerplate UI. Drag and drop stuff into storyboards, move it around, and then just take screenshots of those. If you know your way around Photoshop or Illustrator, there are people who've compiled Illustrator and Photoshop files with all the GUI elements that you can drag and drop and move around. If you need some more custom assets, there's some great services out there, and these are some of the ones that I usually use. Pixabay has a lot of great free resources, which is all free, uh, it's all um, non-licensed and they don't even, you don't need to, it's all public domain, you don't need to attribute or anything like that. It is, I found some good stuff on there that I've used. DeviantArt actually also has a stock and resources, re stock resources and images section, but it'll be different for every artist and work what is available, so, and how they're licensed. So check, most people just ask for attribution, and it's usually just that category there, the resources one, not DeviantArt as a whole. If you're happy to fork over a few dollars, Creative Market has some beautiful assets, and they're usually very reasonably priced. That's usually where I get a lot of stuff I work with when I'm prototyping. And again, if you know your way around Illustrator or anything like that, you can get some those types of files that you can actually modify. And usually they have free goods available every week for a limited time. So I've seen icon sets available there usually. Finally, there's the more expensive or shutter, expensive or subscription-based services we know, things like $1 Photo and Shutterstock, uh, which is at a bit of the higher end of the spectrum. So please only use them if you've actually purchased them. No one likes seeing the Shutterstock watermarked images in your products. Great, we've got some assets now. and. We're going to we want to create something that looks a bit more like this. It still looks a bit boilerplate. That's more or less the default tab bar we're used to seeing. And we're going to use a tool that you know and probably love already, which is Keynote. So let's have a look at a demo. Hopefully they're, they're a bit more kind to me today. So I've got this here. The assets I'm going to be using are going to be a mix of some flat icons that I got from Creative Market and some boilerplate UI for a tabbed app. I've, ev I've edited out the buttons so I can add my own down the bottom there. Again, you can do this, actually do this in storyboards as well. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create a hyperlinked keynote. Our graphics are still gonna be a bit rough because we're still prototyping and we wanna do this as quickly as possible. Perfectionism comes later and believe me, it's hard for me to say that. And so we're gonna start with this nice blank iPhone screen. And I have, so this is my main screen with the 
that's going to be my camera. So, I, but first, I want to add my tab bar images. So it's very nice. You can usually can drag, drag and drop everything. So I've got my view for the sharing. I'm putting in both colors for the active and inactive. I've got my nearby, which will be my beautiful map. I've got my camera. I can add things. I can add in my text. Blue, Helvetica, yep. <laughs> Make Johnny Ive happy. Sorry. And I can reproduce that quickly. Nearby. And maybe sharing. So now what I'm going to do is, because this is going to stay consistent across my slides, I can duplicate that. I can duplicate this slide and delete the ones that I don't want. So here I can get the camera will be active so I can delete those. I can change the color of those to black and then just repeat that here. So this will be my sharing page and then finally my nearby page. So now I want to link these up so that these essentially become my buttons. Usually you can hyperlink any shape on your screen, but for smaller PNGs it can be a bit fiddly. So we're going to just create a shape on top of it and make it transparent. No fill, and then I can duplicate that. And now this is the fun part. I can right click on that and add a link. And I can specify I want this to go to slide one because that's the one we're currently viewing because that's the camera one. And I can specify I want that one to slide two. Now, Kino is very clever. So even though I'm telling it specifically which slide I want, if I add another slide in between, it remembers the link between them. So you don't have to go through and update which slides it's linked to. And then I can actually copy and paste these. If you copy something from one page, it will paste it into the exact same location on the other slide. So already I can have a look at this, and I can click on these buttons, and I can see it switching between them. And that took three minutes, maybe. And I can, anytime I can duplicate one of these slides, it'll duplicate the hyperlinks and keep them in place. So now just quickly, I'm gonna populate my camera page and I've got my camera, it's a beautiful photo I'm taking at the moment. And I can add just another shape for my take a photo button. And I can make that white. And now I want to add the little grid lines and so I can add more. So a lot of what you want to do you can achieve using shapes. And so this is the part where I'm not going to be a perfectionist because my lines aren't even and they're not aligned, but that's not important. That's not what I'm trying to achieve here. And I don't want that. And one more. Easy. And so now if I actually want to take a photo, I can, actually no, I'll fill in the rest of these views. So I can have my share, that's sharing a photo. Oh, there we go. So I've got my shared photos. That's a bit fiddly. We'll do that in a minute. So I've got a better looking map than the one I drew. Knows where we are. And this one's a bit more fiddly because I want I want to because I want to put all my photos out on the line. I can start by bringing in some photos. And I've literally just dragged these from anywhere I can find them on my computer. And I'm not being a perfectionist, although it does help me if I do want to align them a little bit, similar to what we know from auto layout. And you can lock your background images because otherwise you end up moving them all over the place. I can draw another line, which has gone white, which doesn't help me. 
go. Copy and paste that. Now I bring in my other beautiful asset that I've got here, which is my peg. There we are. So putting all the photos out there on the line. <coughs> and copy and paste as your friend. There we go. That's another one using just shapes and images. And let's have a look at that now. There we go. I can toggle between my different views. So I could keep going and I'm not going to go through the whole demo, but if I wanted to do even just one more slide to add another hyperlink to prove that it, it's clever enough to update your slides. So now I'm sharing this photo. And I can say share. And then I can hook up that button, and that's easy because I don't need to add a shape over that because it's already quite a distinctive shape. Slide two, and now we can see it's gonna be clever enough. And when I do that, it goes to that. And when I toggle through, all my links are still intact. So Keynote is very clever like that. So I'm not gonna make you sit through all that. So here is one I prepared earlier. And I've got, you can see I can take my photo, I can share it on Twitter, and I can play with those. And there we go, I can see all the photos of my nearby friends. One thing Keynote lets you do is you can add a few more animations. This is slightly different from some of the tools, some of the other tools we look at where you have to import an entire screenshot. And you can use some of the, so you can add animations to individual elements. So maybe I want my, line, my clothes line with my pictures on the line to move across. I can use an animation such as Magic Move, but it's not something you shouldn't overdo it for the sake of making an animation that no one's ever going to want to code. So, it, but you can have effects that look something like this. If I go to my share view, maybe I can click on this and that moves along. And I can demonstrate that that's kind of the interaction I'll be wanting later. That's a bit fiddly to do. So, I wouldn't rec again, I wouldn't recommend getting too bogged down being a perfectionist. And but that's just some of the stuff you can play with if there's something a bit more complex you want to communicate. One more thing before I move on. So this is great, but I can't put this on my device. Oh, one thing I want to emphasize first as well is we, before you share this, make sure you set the presentation type to links only, because they'll stop someone from just pressing the next button, because then it'll only go with the hyperlinks. They can't just advance through your slides. So the other option I have here is I can actually match the resolution of the slide to the, maybe the resolution of the iPhone that I want to target. Or with an iPad, it's a bit easier because it's kind of roughly the same size. So I could create this mock-up and put it on an iPad and someone can view it through the Keynote app. Otherwise, I can actually set this uh, to any, si any size I want. There's a little gotcha here with the Keynote app on the iPhone where it only works in landscape orientation. So this is set to the orientation of my, the, the size of an iPhone, and I've had to turn it sideways so that when you view it, it actually works like a tappable app. So again, a little bit more work, but you, get so, you can get a prototype that feels quite real. Oh, yes. Um, I think I forgot. So when you want to share something like this, it's pretty easy. You can just send the .keynote file to someone or share it via iCloud where, and so someone can view it directly in the web browser. And, and you get all the inbuilt stuff you get with iCloud sharing and things like that. You can have multiple people working on it in the web browser, which is useful, again, if you've got people in different countries or different, in different cities. So in terms of pros and cons, you probably already have it in some way, shape, or form. You aren't limited to how many files, you can, how many different ones you can create, like we saw with Pop and some of the other ones we'll look at, where you're limited to five projects or something like that. You can 
have kind of more complicated transitions. Some of the other ones give you boilerplate ones, such as swiping and tapping. Um, you can manipulate the individual assets if you want to play around with how things look on the screen. And some of the cons, it's very fiddly because it isn't a dedicated prototyping tool. So don't get too bogged down in spending too much time with it. Hard to simulate an iPhone, as I demonstrated. In terms of cost, it's probably free. You probably already have it. And usually they make it free on most new devices you get now. So, And that is Keynote and Medium Fidelity. I want to take a step back now. Maybe you've been working on your prototype for a bit, and you've lost sight of how it's all coming together. Maybe you've drawn out user experience flowcharts, something that might look like that. And again, there's lots of different dedicated tools that let you do this. And depending on how complex your app is, it can get out of control, which is something with a zooming user interface can help. The next demo is pretty easy because it's using Prezi. So I can actually just put this straight into my presentation. Um, all I've done, so again with Keynote, is I've just, it lets me export those slides individually. So I can drag and drop them in here. I can zoom around and say, OK, excellent. This is the, my three different, my three main options from the tab bar. But hold on, I drew out, let's put that there. I, when I was working on my, product, on my sketches, I drew a settings page, which I haven't put anywhere. I've forgotten to design my settings page, and I haven't quite found a place to put it yet. So I can put this here as a placeholder for myself to remember I need to do that, and I need to find some way to integrate it. So yeah, I have to do this sometime. Um, I use this as well if I want to add some notes, so saying that I want this to swipe sideways to navigate, or if, and I can add notes as well, so maybe if I want to make this a collection view later. And th this is a pretty simple app. So I don't worry too much about it getting out of control. But what I mean by that is this, is another, this was my app that I worked on. And I have a few more options in this one. And already you can see that it gets quite visually complex. And if I had those all at the actual size, it would get quite drawn out and cluttered. So here, especially in like my plus menu, if I want to add content, I can see that I can add content from a photo, from the web, or I can add text. And even within that, I can drill down to different levels of information. This is just an image I've dragged in. Um, and I can see at a glance what my app is supposed to do and what the different options are. And I can even specify if you single tap on an item, this happens. If you double tap on it, this happens. And it's just a way, so something like this, you could print out on your wall and just keep an eye on it to make sure you're on the right track. So I just want to take a slight detour to talk about that. And again, this is something that I've found useful. And maybe depending on your workflow and how you think, may or may not be useful. In terms of high fidelity, I have a few more slick looking graphics now. I've had a designer run away and make me some graphics with some nice gradients and flat UI. And they were particularly inspired by the color scheme of the dev world icon. And so they've incorporated that. I want to create something that is a bit more shiny and, want to, and will resemble the actual product. And again, this is all just working with images. I could actually use Pop for this demo as well, because it has this capability of importing images and adding the connections between them. But in the interest of variety, I'm going to be using Envision. Envision is quite a common one I've seen crop up, a few companies using. And I've used a lot of my own prototypes. And sometimes they send you nice emails and send you stickers and swag and a handwritten note saying thank you for using Envision. Um, there's my handwritten thank you note <laughs> on a post-it note. It's very startup. So these types of, as I mentioned, these types of apps are becoming increasingly common and they vary in price and functionality. Envision lets you create interactive prototypes for iPhone, iPad, Android phone, Android tablet, and web, and lets you view it in a way that feels very native through, and you can add it as an app on device. So we'll have a quick look at that. And that is in Safari here. So I can create a new project, and here it lets me specify which one I want. So those are all the options I mentioned before. 
They've got the skins for the different iPhone sizes as well. I can create this project. And it's a drag and drop UI, which is great. And I can throw that in there, which is full screen, so it's not having me do that. So again, I can probably not go drag all these in. So it uploads those, and the same way I did in Pop, I can add those relationships. I can add, it can detect swipe, it can detect tap or double tap. And one of the biggest wins this one has is you can actually have a scroll position. So if you've got a table or a list of something, you, it doesn't have to be a static image the size of the screen. You can actually have that scrolling. So already I've got these here. I can view that one. Load slowly. And similarly, the way we did with, with Kino, we can actually create a hotspot template. So I can only need to create these buttons once. And then they can be available on any, on any other images that I decide need to have those buttons, and which in the case would be, in this case, would be all of my screens because they all, would all have that menu bar at the bottom, the tab bar at the bottom. Uh, include this in the hotspot template, and final one here, and that one goes to the map, the nearby. can save that, can preview. I think it's just being a bit slow. Oh, there we go. So this one I haven't added my hotspot template, so I can apply the template, maybe. Because it is in the web browser, you're limited to your speed, and I'm tethering off the phone right now, so it's being a bit slow. So again, I can load this on my phone and it acts as a native app. Which of course is being a bit ruined because I have my tethering hotspot at the top. And of course, because that's being a bit slow, what I can actually do is I can give you the link to that so you can have a look at it in your own time. Because I think I'm starting to run a bit short of time. So we can use that to put our assets together. And then when you want to share it, you're, when you send it with a URL and someone views it on an iOS device, it actually forces them to do that. So they have to add it as a home screen, as a button on their home screen, which links to that website, which has your app on it, and so they can view it almost like an app. You can add an app icon, you can customize the status bar color, it, it gives you lots of great customization options. So, and you can... And that's the link for the one that I've just created, which is bit.ly slash INDW14, Envision DevWorld14. And the, another thing they've got for collaboration and sharing is something called Live Share, which, is, which lets you in real time show someone through the web browser, the diff, take you through it, has voice chat, uh, text chat, and you can highlight and annotate all over it. And that actually works on iPad as well. I was playing with it the other day and it worked very well. So lots of pros for that one. It has, it gives you a native experience. It's easy to share and collaborate. It's very highly customizable. It's easy, it's pretty easy to use. And you have that live share capability. Cons, um, it is through the web browser. So as you saw, um, but dependent on the speed, the basic, I say basic transitions because it gives you the 
default boilerplate ones that apply to the entire screen. The price of it, this one you actually have to pay for. The first one's free, so as I might send you some free coasters and stickers. Um, but other than that, it's usually between $5, $25 a month, depending on what plan you choose, or they have enterprise and group licensing as well, which goes a bit upwards. And finally, uh, as I'm starting, to, well, not quite finally, but this is all quite time consuming. And especially at the higher fidelity end, and at this point, I encourage you to think about what you need to achieve from the process of prototyping and the balance between fidelity and time. If you're predominantly a coder, you might be looking at going, I can actually code this a lot faster than I'd be able to prototype it, and that's a completely valid point. Prototyping does take time, and if you're looking to just generate ideas, you'll probably be down this end of the spectrum with the paper prototypes. If you want to communicate ideas or pitch to a client, you'd probably be looking more in that mid-range. And then maybe if you're pitching to a venture capitalist for millions of ideas, that's for millions of dollars, that's probably more than you want to be looking at. And depending on the assets that you're trying to use and the tools you're using, money can actually be a factor as well, whether you invest in those graphics at, that, at the prototyping stage or just later. It's important to find the balance in your workflow, and this will depend on the type of team you're working in, the kind of design methodology you follow, what kind of app you're building, who you're making your app for, and these are the types of things you need to consider. Before I wrap up, I want to touch very briefly on some expert level tools. These are ones that give you a lot more control over animation, and, but they're definitely up the more time consuming, fiddly end of the scale. Not Xcode. Um, they're close. <laughs> and so these are these apps, these programs that you make them to the point where it feels like someone that it is coded when is it. So Quartz Composer can, yes, yeah, so the main thing we've been lacking so far is any real indication of animation beyond the basics. We can see some beautiful animations in iOS that often can help add to the meaning of what it is your app is trying to communicate. And by this, as I mentioned, I don't mean using Magic Move to create some kind of very fancy animation that no one is ever going to code. If you've ever used Quartz Composer with a few plugins, such as Origami by Facebook, you can create some beautiful animations using patches that look something like this. So this was created not by me, um, but uh, someone who works for a startup in Auckland using completely just Quartz Composer. And the process of that looks something crazy like this with lots of patches. If you're not used to working with patches, as you can see, it can be quite fiddly, and this is very much into the high, con high time consuming end of this picture if you're not used to what you're doing. Another one that I only found out about through the process of making this presentation, oh, I can't take any t credit for that one. There's an excellent tutorial for how to make that at the link there by someone called Jackie Lee from Auckland. Another similar tool that uses patches is called Form. It's a similar concept, but, you, you, but they've made their own native app, Mac app to do it. And paired with the companion iOS app, you can see your prototype update in real time on the device. And it even gives you access to devices hardware, such as the camera and other sensors. So this is just, again, from their website, this is not something that I can take credit for. And you can see a similar thing with lots of patches and an animated and an animation on the iPhone. I don't have time to go into much more detail about these, but check it out if that's something you think you'd be interested in. Um, and there's the link for that one there as well. It's relative wave slash four. It looks very powerful, but the other one's also definitely at the high cost end of the spectrum. I think that app is $150. You're never going to be able to create a perfect one-for-one -one replica of what your app is, trying, is going to look like. And I want to stress again that that is not the point. Don't lose sight of what it is that you're trying to achieve. And what it is you're making is essentially a fake app. You're not going to put that on the app store to make your millions. Most humans are pretty good at using their imaginations. And so they can fill any gaps that your app has. And if they've used an iPhone or iPad or a tablet before, they can figure out, OK, that's what that's supposed to be representing. There are times when those apps, those gaps are going to be pretty big, and so you won't be able to convey 
everything you need to through buttons and taps. Some of these apps let you detect gestures, such as tap, uh, swiping, and double tapping, but you can't prototype other inputs, such as interaction from other users, through things such as networked apps, or collaborative apps, or games, or apps that rely solely on, or the apps that rely on games can be hard to prototype, and actually from the keynote this morning, there was some other tools mentioned that can help with this. So something like, you probably wouldn't use these tools to prototype games, um, location awareness, input from hardware, these tools don't really support. Even something like rotation and shaking the device. Some of them might. I haven't tried out every single tool on the market. So have a play and see what works for you. But this was, so this was the main problem that I was facing when I was developing my app, where my app worked in a networked mode and a standalone mode. And the standalone mode was very easy to prototype. Uh, well, the networked mode was, OK, well, how do I make it look like there's someone else here? Don't let, the prototype lim lim don't let prototyping limit you. If it's not really communicating the full potential of what your app is supposed to do, there are other ways to go about it, even if it's not on-device native experience. Sometimes, and that's why we code, after all, because we can pretty much do anything with coding, um, more or less, depending what the platform allows you to do. And sometimes, actually, code is a very perfectly legitimate way of prototyping, especially with new playgrounds and the Swift and playgrounds. There's some great abstraction layers that can help get you get these things off the ground quickly with things like multi-peer connectivity for networked apps so you don't have to go write your own networked, networking framework. And I'll actually be talking more about this tomorrow, about how to write your own networking framework. And games, you have things like SpriteKit, which, can, which I've heard, I haven't played with, but I've heard that can be really great for getting games off the ground. Otherwise, get creative with the methods we've used already. Put two iPhones on your keynote slide and use that as a way to demonstrate how they react when they come together. Even if it's not interactive, it's about communicating your idea. So finally, the more design people in the room might be cringing because I've had my one idea, which started on my paper, and I followed that through. And I want to stress that the focus of this was not on how to generate new ideas and iterate on that same idea. As I mentioned, there's the WWDC talk from this year, which focuses more on that side of things. There's so many tools out there to get the job done, and, as, and it's important to just try them out, see what works for you. These are the ones that I've worked with and I use regularly and I love. So the few, there's a few key features you should look out for that are more or less standard across these tools, and that's things like live sync, making sure everything's up to date across all devices, collaboration, sharing with the URL, uh, and viewing natively on the device. Prototype your ideas fully and get feedback from people before you spend hours on code. Or if you're working as part of a team, you can make sure everyone's on the same page about what actually needs to be developed. It saves lots of time, money, and stress. So my final notes is you should is carry a notebook. You never know when you get ideas. Uh, show some love for the pen and paper or for the paper app and the pop app, as the case may be. Don't stop at your first idea. It probably won't be the best one you could come up with. Take time to actually collate your assets. If you have a folder of them, then it can be very quickly, with a lot of these tools, just drag and drop, rather than losing your train of thought to hunt, go off and hunt for an asset that you are missing. Give your prototypes to people. And this is what I mean. So as I was saying before, that people are going to think completely different to you. And that's the beauty of individuality. So we all, we're all going to think differently. The same way we need to test apps on devices, make sure you test your prototypes on real devices and the way that it, you're intended to be experienced. It, that can even be something like if you, it's something that the user is supposed to be using while they're walking. Put it in your hand and walk down the street and see if it works in that context. If you're a designer, don't be afraid to dabble in some code. If you're a coder, don't be afraid to grab some assets and have a go cobbling something together or grabbing pen and paper. And finally, probably the point that I can't stress enough from my own personal experience is don't be a perfectionist. It's so easy to get bogged down in the details and try to make everything look perfect and trying to get the pixels all in the right place. And that's not the point. And this, making the demos for this talk probably took me longer than it should have because I was being a perfectionist. So 
that's me. Um, that's how you can email me or tweet me or come talk to me through the rest of the conference. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm presenting tomorrow. And another, oh, you should talk to Tim Raphael as well. He gave another really interesting presentation directly before this one about using phone gap for, for prototyping. And that lets you actually use things like camera and hardware. And I think he recorded that. So if you, if you, if you can't travel in time, then um, go watch the recording of that. Other than that, thank you. I might have a minute for a question before we have to change over and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you for coming.